Right. Hello, everybody. So, in this video, I'll be discussing about the anatomy and physiology of the basal ganglia, and then I'll be providing a brief overview about Parkinson's disease. So, what are the components of basal ganglia? So, basal ganglia has the following components: it has the striatum, which is essentially the combination of the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the nucleus accumbens. Okay, N A C C means nucleus. accumbens then there is the pallidum pallidum means it has two components one is the globus pallidus externus and the globus pallidus internus an extension of the globus pallidus internus goes into the midbrain and that is known as the snpr or the substantia nigra pars reticulata then there is the subthalamic nucleus and then we finally have the S N P R, sorry, this should be S N P C. That is substantia nigra pars compacta. In addition, there may be three more extra components. Rather, there are three more extra components. One is the red nucleus. Next, we have the. amygdaloid body and finally we have also the claustrum Let's just take this up yeah claustrum so these are essentially the seven components of basal ganglia now to understand the functionality of the basal ganglia these four are the principal components we need to understand these three are mainly accessory components which form a part of the neural pathways but striatum pallidum substan uh, subthalamic nucleus and substantia nigra pars compactum the functioning of all these form an essential part of basal ganglia basal ganglia physiology so i'll just provide a brief anatomical overview because um, for those who haven't completed the neuroanatomy it will be possibly very it will be very difficult to correlate these uh, nuclei names so just to provide a brief anatomical overview uh, in a cross section if we go from medial to lateral then this is the corpus callosum over here this is the thalamus this is a caudate nucleus over here we have the internal capsule so we are going from medial to lateral from medial to lateral so this is the internal capsule there here is the anterior limb this is the genu this is the posterior limb this is the retro lentiform part and below it there is the sub lentiform part this is the triangular structure we call the lentiform nucleus it is the combination of globus pallidus and putamen globus pallidus is located medially and putamen laterally then we have this white band which we call the external capsule then we have over here this orange band which we call the claustrum lateral to that we have another capsule which we call the extreme capsule and finally over here we have the insular cortex so this is an axial view now let's move on to a sagittal view right so this is a sagittal view uh this portion is the putamen this is the these are the globus pallidus internus and externus this thing is the caudate nucleus and somewhere below over here we will have the amygdaloid body okay now these are your subthalamic nuclei over here we have the substantia nigra and here we have the thalamus okay so this midline structure over here will be the thalamus so that's your basic orientation of the basal ganglia just to uh, get you familiarized once more with the orientation this is a t2 weighted mri image taken uh, actually so uh, now in mri is there t1 and t2 weighted images um 
and you study radiology will become uh, you'll understand these better but just for the time being remember in t1 weighted images g will appear g and w will appear w that is gray matter will appear gray and white matter will appear white and the CSO will also appear white however in t2 these are re reversed the gray matter will appear white and the white matter will appear gray and the CSO will also appear bright bright white okay so this is a T2 weighted image over here this is the caudate nucleus this is the thalamus over here there is the internal capsule and here we have your lentiform nucleus okay so that's your basic orientation and anatomical overview of the basal ganglia now the basal ganglia has four circuits or four loops there is the motor loop there is a cognitive loop there is a limbic loop and there is an oculomotor loop oculomotor loop concerns your prefrontal cortex the limbic loop involves the limbic system but the motor loop is the one we have to be concerned about because that is the one which is implicated in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease so let's study about the motor loop in detail it will have two pathways a direct pathway and an indirect pathway the direct pathway is the dominant pathway which is functioning in a healthy basal ganglia the indirect pathway has a uh, performs very less but it may take over if the direct pathway is diseased or is not functioning due to some reason okay so let's move on to that right so these are the two pathways these look a little complex but I'll try and break it down as much as possible so please follow this portion closely right so here sorry again I am very tech savvy as you can see anyway so this is the direct pathway <coughs> the red arrows are all the excitatory inputs and outputs the blacks are all the inhibitory ones the excitatory input and output main in the CNS mainly involves the glutamine neurotransmitter okay so they, those are glutaminergic pathways and the inhibitory pathways include GABA so those are GABA pathways <coughs> now dopaminergic pathways can go either way they can be excitatory they can be inhibitory as well excitatory pathways uh, involve the use of the D1 type of dopamine receptor and the inhibitory pathways involve the use of the D2 type of inhibitory receptors D2 type of dopaminergic receptors okay so first the direct pathway so over here there is the this is the motor cortex this is your striatum this is your globus pallidus externus this is your globus pallidus internus <coughs> this is your ventrolateral nucleus of thalamus uh, this portion got a bit hidden over here yeah this is your SMA there is a supplementary motor area and again back to the motor cortex so what happens the motor cortex gives an excitatory output one goes here this is your corticospinal tract this goes uninterrupted the next output is this one to the striatum the cortical striatal pathway this is glutaminergic and excitatory the striatum when it gets excited sends inhibitory signals to the globus pallidus internus and the globus pallidus internus thus gets inhibited now normally there this is there is this cabargic pathway moving from the globus pallidus internus to the ventrolateral nucleus of thalamus so normally the gpi is inhibiting the vln via uh, releasing this gaba but once striatum inhibits globus pallidus internus ventrolateral nucleus of thalamus is disinhibited because globus pallidus internus is no longer uh, sending gabargic output so when the ventrolateral nucleus of thalamus gets disinhibited it sends glutaminergic efferents to the supplementary motor area the supplementary motor area further sends glutaminergic efferents to the motor primary motor cortex and this circuit continues 
so the main thing in the direct pathway is this inhibition of the ventrolateral nucleus of thalamus because of inhibition of the globus pallidus internus via through because of the efferents gabbard efferents arising from the striatum now <coughs> the striatum can be also excited by one another connection and that is this arising from the substantia nigra pars compacta this dopaminergic outflow excites the striatum via the d1 receptors and but but then the similar pathway follows that is inhibition of gpi disinhibition of vln excitation of sma and then finally excitation of the primary motor cortex this is what encompasses your direct pathway now let's move on to the indirect pathway first let me remove the ink right so what happens in indirect pathway is this in indirect pathway the striatum is sending an inhibitory signal to the globus pallidus externus not internus the globus pallidus externus the globus pallidus externus further sends inhibitory sig is normally sending inhibitory signals to this nucleus over here which is this subthalamic nucleus now what happens is that when the striatum sends uh, inhibitory signals to the globus pallidus externus the globus pallidus externus gets inhibited and it stops inhibiting the subthalamic nucleus so over here the subthalamic nucleus is getting disinhibited okay when the subthalamic nucleus is disinhibited it excites the globus pallidus internus when it excites the globus pallidus externus sorry the globus pallidus internus it will send inhibitory signals to the ventrolateral nucleus of thalamus this glutaminergic efferent to the sma will stop and the motor cortex will actually be inhibited so essentially this is a inhibitory pathway that is striatum is inhibiting the gpe gpe which is normally inhibiting the stn is no longer doing so the stn gets disinhibited the stn excites the gpi the gpi inhibits the vln the vln uh, is hence no longer exciting the sma and the sma thus no longer excites the primary motor cortex and over here the substantia nigra pars compacta actually tries to inhibit the striatum via the d2 receptors okay so if the substantia nigra pars compacta is inhibiting the striatum via the uh, d2 receptors what happens is that this inhibitory effort from the striatum to the globus pallidus externus will not go the globus pallidus externus will freely inhibit the stn the stn will not be exciting the gpi and hence the gpi will not be inhibiting the vln and the vln will be freely activating the sma and the sma will activate the primary motor cortex and the process will continue so and please note that while this is going on the direct pathway is also operating okay so the direct pathway is actually the dominant pathway it is operating at all times the snpc uh, sorry the indirect pathway where the snpc is acting on the d2 receptors in the striatum it operates occasionally dominance of the direct pathway is a sign of a healthy basal ganglia in parkinson's disease this pathway from the striat the striatum nigral pathway that is this dopaminergic pathway from the snpc to the striatum is diseased it's absent so what will happen is that this excitation will not be there and hence the primary motor cortex will not be stimulated either via the direct pathway or via the indirect pathway and hence ultimately what will happen is that there will be onset of bradykinesia tremors and rigidity will follow so that's the pathophys uh, that the basic physiology of the basal ganglia 
so now let's begin with parkinson's disease in itself so parkinson's disease 85% to 95% of the cases are sporadic but 5 to 15% are familial in nature scientists have been able to isolate four genes which cause familial parkinson's disease and these the identification of these genes their functionality their physiology has helped the scientist to unfold the mystery in uh, or the process which is involved in the pathogenesis of parkinson's disease so the four genes which are implicated in parkinson's disease are snca then there is the glucocerebrosidase gene gca actually the gca gene discovery was interesting because uh, the gca gene the glucocerebrosidase gene is the one which is implicated in gauche's disease actually scientists have observed that patients of gauche's disease their relatives often had parkinson's disease so they found this correlation and from that it led to the discovery of gca being implicated in parkinson's disease as well then there is this lrrk2 gene which is used uh, which is actually implicated in a particular population known as the ashkenazi jews and finally there is this pink one and parkin genes so these are the four and or four or five genes which are implicated in parkinson's disease so what actually happens is that it is proposed that this essence essence here refers to synuclein okay so this synuclein uh, gene product or the synuclein protein is actually a prion protein and when it's misfolded it forms beta pleated sheets uh, rather the beta pleated sheet uh, concentration increases uh, in the protein structure they aggregate uh, to form these lewy bodies there are tangles and aggregations and there is formation of these lewy bodies formation of these lewy bodies is actually the main pathology which is involved in parkinson's disease these lewy bodies uh, result in toxicity to the dopaminergic neurons now these misfolded proteins further inhibit these lysosomes and they also inhibit a if a normal gca gene now what is gca gca is a glucocerebrosidase gene and if these are mutated lysosomal functions are mutated but if the lysosomal function is mutated then these misfolded proteins will not be cleared okay so essence and mutation in gca go rather hand in hand okay in isolated essence uh, mutations also there will be inhibition of lysosomes and the normal gca gene will also be inhibited now there is uh, the lrrk2 mutation over here there is actually altered phosphorylation of target proteins due to activation of kinases so kinase inhibitors ha are been tried for treatment of parkinson's disease particularly in, in those patients who have this lrrk2 p dot g 2019 s mutation okay that's the complete mutation name so this mutation the kinase inhibitors may be useful but so far it's being seen that they have a very high toxicity and hence uh, it's better to avoid them then the pink one and parkin gene mutations the parkin gene mutation is the most common one which accounts for 77% of cases of juvenile parkinson's disease and 10 to 20% cases overall of early onset parkinson's disease but these more or less have a stable course the defect over here is defective ubiquitination of target proteins uh, i hope you remember from your biochemistry that ubiquitin is actually a marker protein which is which helps to mark all those uh, proteins which have to be degraded so defective ubiquitination of target proteins and mitochondrial dysfunction so this is the gene the Patho complete pathogenesis of familiar Parkinson's disease, and these processes are in, are involved even in sporadic cases as well. Identification of these genes and their normal physiology has helped uh, scientists to understand the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease. Right. So the cardinal motor features of Parkinson's disease include bradykinesia, resting tremor. rigidity and postural instability this resting tremor is important because 
if you know that uh, intention tremor is seen in cerebral diseases okay other motor features include micrographia mast facies reduced eye blinking drooling a soft voice dysphagia and freezing and non motor features include anosmia sensory disturbances mood disorders like depression sleep disturbances like the rapid eye movement uh, uh, sleep is disturbed disturb. the orthostatic hypotension gastrointestinal disturbances genital urinary disturbances sexual dysfunction these are all the autonomic disturbances and there may be cognitive impairment and dementia as well parkinsonism is actually a genetic term that is used to define a syndrome manifested by bradykinesia fit rigidity and tremors so parkinsonism and parkinson's disease are not actually synonymous parkinson's disease is a subset of parkinsonism parkinsonism includes like i said parkinson's disease sporadic and genetic lewy body dementia then atypical parkinsonism so these are the complete list uh, of differential diagnosis of parkinsonism you need not go through all these uh, some things which you will po- probably correlate are these wilson's disease huntington's disease uh, we have cryan disease here as well and toxin mediated uh, parkinsonism due to mptp that is 1 methyl 4 phenyl 1 to 5 6 tetrahydropyridine cyanide uh, methanol da- drug induced parkinsonism which is seen due to antipsychotics or antiemetics like metoclopramide okay so these this is parkinsonism please don't confuse parkinsonism with parkinson's disease right so this is the this is a histopathological section this is of the mid brain over here this is in a normal patient and this is in a uh, parkinson's disease patient over here you can see that there is a gross atrophy and also there is loss of this substantia nigra there is pigment loss over here which you can clearly see again this is a normal histopathological section this is a histopathological section in a parkinson's disease patient where you can see there is a decrease quantity of those neurons and these are your lewy bodies which are aggregates of alpha sin nucleine protein okay so these are a few pictures you should familiarize yourself with and finally this is a pet ct scan and just to show uh, just to generate a bit of interest uh, don't have to be too troubled by it uh, this scan show is in a parkinson's disease patient where th- there is reduced uptake of the uh, radioactive dye and this is in a normal patient where there is increased uptake of the radioactive dye in the basal ganglion why increased uptake because over here there is this red color and yellow color and over here there is just mostly this green color okay so m- more and more uptake the hotter the color okay so that's all with respect to this thank you for watching it